Hello, and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we will continue our reading of Early Days by Miss Reed. She is reminiscing about her first days at her new school after her family has moved to the countryside. I might well have been bullied, for I was definitely the odd one, a lone stranger amidst these closely knit children, many of whom had known each other from birth. Apart from their general good nature and my own resilience, I unwittingly found another way to make friends. On my previous birthday, I had been given a scooter, which I loved dearly. It was a simple affair of a wooden platform and an upright wooden column which sprouted two handles. With one's left foot on the platform and one's right foot pushing energetically at the ground, a fair turn of speed could be enjoyed. Downhill, of course, it was utter bliss, and my sister, who also had one, demonstrated this by standing on her scooter at the top of the hill outside our house and rushing down the steep quarter of a mile to the main London road without needing to put a foot to the ground. We played this game down the steep slope of the North Downs until our parents discovered it and forbade us to go right to the traffic at the bottom so that, much to our chagrin, we were obliged to put our feet down some fifty yards short of our target. At the head of the hill, opposite our house, was a notice board, which warned carters about the steepness of the hill before them, and exhorted them not to attempt it unless with properly adjusted skid pan. I think our right shoes acted as our skid pans, for they were always worn through well before the left ones. Miss Ellis gave me permission to bring my scooter to school, and I pounded along in fine style, little thinking of the effect it would have on my schoolfellows. I had made the journey alone that morning, and as soon as I rattled into the village, I was surrounded by admiring children. The boys were particularly interested and asked deferentially if they could have a go. They took turns in scooting up and down the pavement below the school wall while I sat on the steps and watched. The school bell rang whilst the fun continued. When it stopped, the boys lugged it up the steps for me, begging me to let me have turns again at playtime. My star was certainly in the ascendant, and I was in the rare position of being able to state my terms. As it happened, my scooter was banned from the playground, although I was allowed to keep it in an obscure corner of the lobby and ride it to and from school. Needless to say, I had an accompaniment of entreating schoolfellows whenever I had my scooter with me. In my early days at Chelsfield School, my scooter was hard-worked, partly, I suspect, because of the influence it gave me over my schoolfellows, but also because that summer in 1921 was one of endless sunshine and, consequently, quite severe drought. I remember a straw hat which my mother made me wear. It was a boater shape, with a ribbon band of pale pink with pale blue spots. The ends hung down behind, a little longer than my hair, with fringe, and streamed behind as I scorched along on my trusty scooter. The hat was anchored by elastic under the chin. My cotton frocks were cut in Magyar style, the short sleeves cut in one with the straight front and back, and a scooped or squared neckline. These, no doubt, were run up by my dressmaker, dear Aunt Jess, whom I had left behind at 267 Hither Green Lane with Grandma Reed. These cotton frocks had knickers to match, which was considered very avant-garde by my contemporaries. That summer I wore no socks, just leather sandals, the right ones soon becoming dilapidated by friction with the gritty road. I don't think I ever realized the freedom of loose, light clothing so much as I did in that scorching summer. As a small child, I had worn a vest, chemise, petticoat, knickers, frock, and pinafore. It was wonderful to have shed so many superfluous layers. One would have thought that with so much clothing discarded by my mother, that overpowering hat would have gone the same way. 
but in those days, heads seemed to have been considered particularly vulnerable to weather in all its variety, so hats were deemed absolutely essential. Most of my school friends sported plain linen affairs, which I thought very smart and practical, but as my own large straw was much admired by quite big girls of ten or more, I grew fonder of it in time. Most of the girls in that hot summer wore frocks made of cotton check gingham or flowered print, but knickers were mostly white with elastic at waist and leg, although a few children still wore white cotton drawers buttoned up to a liberty bodice. Pinafores, too, were still worn by one or two girls, and in the March of my arrival, when winter clothes were the rule, white pinafores, black stockings, and laced-up black boots were the accepted wear by some of the girls. Hair was worn long, either in plates or drawn back and tied up in a bow on the crown of the head. A little later, the American bob hairstyle became the thing, a great saving in hair ribbons and celluloid hair slides, which were always getting lost or broken. The boys of my age were in shorts, usually of gray flannel, and jerseys with collars, shirt style. In hot weather, they wore short-sleeved cotton shirts. I much admired their striped belts, which fastened with a snake's head buckle. Those elderly gentlemen of thirteen and fourteen in Mr. Clark's class were clad in long trousers, some, I suspect, adapted from their father's cast-offs. What with long trousers, breaking voices, and such important duties as counting heads morning and afternoon, not to mention collecting trays full of inkwells, it is no wonder that we small fry beyond the partition looked upon them as practically Mr. Clark's contemporaries. They were held in some respect, and on the whole, were a good influence on us younger ones. Within a year or so, they would be out in the world, the majority following their fathers into agricultural work but some to take up work in carpenters' shops or garages. One or two would go into the army, but very few would go on to higher education. I cannot recall any boy winning a scholarship to the local grammar school. Times were still hard after the 1914-18 war, and were to become harder still as the Depression approached. Agriculture was in a sad way, and most country families needed every penny that could be brought in by their wage earners. The boys themselves seemed ready and eager at fourteen to get out into the world, and as far as one could see, had no regrets about abandoning school learning. They were not great readers, although the girls seemed to be. When they left school, the latter would probably find their chief re relaxation in books borrowed, as likely as not, from the splendid libraries which Kent County Council provided very early. Our family had particular cause to be grateful for this excellent service, for we were all avid readers, and paid a weekly visit to the reading room to rummage through the library box for new treasures. One of my library books, Twelve Stories and a Dream, by H. G. Wells, I remember particularly vividly, as Tony, our adored mongrel dog, chewed it up, and we were obliged to pay some horrific sum, I think it was four shillings, for its replacement. Our school library was poor. One or two adventure stories by Henry and R. L. Stevenson seemed to be the boys' sustenance, and I believe Louisa May Alcott was provided for us girls. But almost all of one of these three shelves was taken up by a row of identical, gray-covered books with the title Thrift. They must have been presented to the school by some earnest society intent on educating the poor. But in fact, they were as gray inside as out, completely unreadable, and fit only for the pulping machine. Mr. Clark was generous in lending books from his own shelves, and I recall plowing through his copy of David Copperfield, which my mother insisted must be shrouded in brown paper, while in my care, to protect it. We had one or two readers in our desks, mostly composed of extracts from Goldsmith, Shakespeare, Scott, and the like. There was a dearth of humorous writing and very little poetry. Most of the latter was learnt by rote in the lower junior classes under Miss Ellis's supervision, and I suspect that the school leavers as a whole had only these remnants to cheer them through life. In Mr. Clark's class, we were given a poetry book occasionally and told to learn a poem. 
Some of the girls did this conscientiously, and I know that I learned Walter de la Mare's enchanting poem, Nod, at that time. It is with me still. To test our poetical knowledge, Mr. Clark sometimes called out a child at random to recite. The boys, to a man, reeled off that rather dreadful poem of Wordsworth's. The cock is crowing, the stream is flowing, the small birds twitter, the lake doth glitter, etc., which they had been compelled to learn years earlier. Somehow they always got away with it, and we girls, who had been industrious, were rightly incensed. But when it came to singing, the school came into its own. We were well drilled in tonic sulfa, the narrow strip of shiny material draped over the blackboard, and our teacher's red-tipped pointer bounding up and down from do to so to do while we sang to its demands. Mr. Clark had a superb bass voice, almost as velvety dark as Paul Robeson's, and led us surely through the intricacies of the National Songbook, with Miss Ellis accompanying on the piano. We really enjoyed singing lessons, and probably our favorite was Charlie is My Darling, for which we were all impressed by one of the big boys who was kind, good-looking, and already a charmer, and whose name was Charlie. We sang it with all the fervor of youthful admiration rather than ardor for the Jacobite cause, and if Mr. Clark knew what lay behind our fortissimo rendering, as he surely did, he gave no sign. Exploring. The Easter holiday brought my sister Lil home for good, much to our mutual pleasure. Unlike some sisters, separated by three years in age, we always got on well together. Naturally, we had our fights, too. Lil was much cleverer than I was in these encounters, and one of her subtlest moves, when I was about five and had just mastered garter stitch, was to do a roll of pearl knitting on my plain knitted doll's scarf. Powerless to unravel it, and yet loathing this wrong line in my painfully acquired inch of work, I could only yell with rage, or I may have bitten her. I was rather good at biting when young. Occasionally we had fights over our dolls, usually if we were playing schools with them. They sat in a row, usually propped against the fender, and were given arithmetic tests, I hardly need say, by Lil. We were supposed to do our own doll's papers, and as Lil's mathematical ability was always outstanding, and mine just the opposite, my poor charges invariably failed, and Lil's succeeded brilliantly. However, I retaliated later, by jumping out unexpectedly, preferably in darkness, from handy cupboards and corners, and frightening my sister into quaking terror. I found this ruse very satisfactory. During those first summer months, we explored our new surroundings, enjoying each other's company after our brief separation. The garden was still in the making. Flower beds were being dug by my father and a vegetable patch. A tennis court was also laid out, and one or two chicken houses, complete with runs, were set up. My father, in common with a lot of men after the war, was deluded enough to imagine that a small fortune could be made from chicken farming. He soon found that it was one of the quickest roads to penury, but at least we always had plenty of eggs to eat. But it was outside our garden gate that we found most of our excitement. There was a roadside pond almost opposite our house. In the early spring it was awash with frog spawn, I was to discover, but even now in April it had its charms. Trees grew around three sides, mostly scrubby hawthorns, but there was one large tree, probably a crabapple or wild cherry, which we could climb. Here we found a perch and watched the occasional passerby who had no knowledge of his hidden and delighted watchers. The pond was not large enough to harbor moorhens or mallards, but homely birds, like blackbirds and starlings, or a flutter of squabbling little tabby sparrows, came to drink and splash in the shallows, and we were entranced. Halfway down the steep hill, a cart track led off which ended in a south-facing field heavily hedged. These hedges yielded more joy, for under them grew sheets of blue violets, many of them sweet-smelling, and a little later spangles of white stitchwort, whose seed pods could be popped with great satisfaction.
One hedge was composed of bullis bushes, that round, pale, green, wild fruit which is scarce these days. Later that year we picked basketfuls of these little plums and made pounds of scarlet jelly, sharp to the taste, which made a welcome addition to larder shelves. During that summer we discovered wild strawberries, dog roses, honeysuckle, bryony, wild hops, and scores of other delights in that field, some appealing to taste or scent, or simply enchanting the eye with color and form. But even more exciting was the wood which lay beyond it. It was one of those pleasant and welcoming oak and hazel woods, now becoming rare, giving way as they have to the sinister conifer plantations to be seen dominating so much of our countryside. Our wood was light. The sunshine shone through the leaves upon clumps of primroses, and later the sea of bluebells whose scent was everywhere. Underfoot, the ground was soft with the leaf mold of centuries. Plenty of rabbits burrowed there or skittered away at our approach with a glimpse of white scuts. Now and again a squirrel could be seen leaping airily, a puff of gray smoky fur in the branches overhead. And always there were birds. Wood pigeons clattered from the oak trees, blackbirds fled squawking from the bramble bushes, tits collected the swinging caterpillars from their gossamer threads to carry to their young, and scores of birds unseen rustled among the dead leaves or stirred the young bracken. Every visit to the wood brought fresh discoveries. In one clearing, a gigantic beech tree grew on a sandy slope. This provided massive low branches, gray and crinkled like elephant skin, upon which we sat, bouncing up and down with the wind in our hair. We found a yew tree not far away, which soon became our particular headquarters. It was easy to climb, and we would sit aloft in its aromatic fastness, picking at the trunk to uncover its pink fleshiness, and relishing the comfort of its rough support and the glossy beauty of its foliage. Sometimes we brought our dolls to enjoy the pleasures of the wood. We would make diminutive jellies or tiny sandwiches for them, and give them a picnic in some particularly favored glade. Tony, the dog, always accompanied us, although he resented being left below the trees we climbed, and mooched about whining pathetically at being deserted. On one occasion, when my sister and I and another little friend called Peggy were taking our ease high in the yew tree, there was the crack of an air gun, and Tony, far below, began yelping in terror. As one man yelping ourselves, we crashed down through the branches, knickers, liberty bodices, skirts, hair, all drawn upward, to confront a startled man with a light gun. He was looking white and shaken, as well as he might, at the sight of three such vociferous little girls. "'You ought to look at what you're shooting at!' screamed Peggy, scarlet-faced, and the superbly ungrammatical sentence and its intonation has stayed with me over the years. Tony was engulfed in our loving embraces. There was a slight smear of blood on his chest where the pellet had grazed him, but this did not stop the dog from making the most of his troubles, and I remember we took turns carrying him home after berating the man soundly, threatening him with the police, fathers, the RSPCA, and any other relevant authority we could call to mind. Tony lay on his back, his forelegs stiffly in the air, as we bore him homeward. He weighed a tongue and after having disinfectant dabbed on his wound, recovered immediately at the sight of his dinner plate. Looking back now, some sixty-odd years on, I suppose the man had been out to get a rabbit for the larder, saw a movement, and took a pot shot. The sudden descent of three wrathful children falling from the heavens must have made him glad he had not let fly at a pigeon or any other animal near our lofty perch. He was certainly a very frightened man. The pond, the hazel wood, the fields, and hedgerows provided us with a thousand marvels. An old chalk pit across a nearby field gave us endless pleasure as we slid down the slopes to the detriment of our clothes. Downland country is always at its best in summer, and that never-to-be-forgotten spell of brilliant sunshine, week after week, gilded the long outdoor days, burnished our town-bred limbs, bleached our hair, and illumined our memories forever. 
Only streams were lacking in that part of the North Downs, but later we found the thrill of running water when we walked to Shoreham in the Darrant Valley some four miles away, the village immortalized by Samuel Palmer. Later still, as we grew older, bolder, and stronger, we explored more of these lovely villages, Otford, Braisted, Chevering, carrying our picnic lunches and bringing home the gold of King's Cup exotic trophies from a foreign land. A Reluctant Musician During that summer term, Lil and I went to school together. I don't think the impact made upon my sister was very great. For one thing, she only spent one term there, and I spent ten. But there was another good reason. Her thoughts were of school ahead and the results of the examination which she had sat recently. These obligatory weeks at the village school were of a temporary nature, and although the respite from town pressures must have been welcome, the school and its children were not to affect her as keenly as they did me. News came during that term that she had been given a place at Blackheath High School, and the family rejoiced. Naturally, there was a great deal of preparation to be done, and there was a flurry of shopping for school uniform, black stockings, name tapes, shoe bags, a satchel, and so on. Although I was proud of her achievement, I was secretly glad that I was spared all this bother. The biggest worry of all was how Lil was to get to this new school from Chelsfield. At that time, there was no bus along the main Hastings Road to London, and trains did not fit in. It was necessary to get to Farnborough, where a 47 bus could be caught. This was a good three miles from home and mostly uphill. She would have to make the journey twice daily by bicycle, as well as the bus trip. It meant a very early start in the mornings, which was not too awful in summer, but the winter trips were formidable. The fear of traffic and the fear of child molesters were minimal in those happier days, but my parents soon realized the journey was really too much for a young girl, particularly as homework increased. In the end, Lil was transferred to a school in Bromley, a much more accessible place which could be reached by train and later by bus. Meanwhile, I settled happily to my carefree life. By now, I had made several good friends. Besides Hilda, I relished the company of Margaret from the post office, and particularly that of Nora Foreman, whose father was a fruit farmer at Well Hill. These friends sometimes came to tea, or I went to their homes, where we inspected each other's toys, exchanged books, dressed each other's dolls, or simply enjoyed the strange pleasures of a different house and garden. My parents, too, began to make friends as soon as the early settling-in process was over. They both joined the church choir and the local glee club. Both were musical and sang well, and my father had played the organ at church from the age of about 14 or so. It was no wonder that they had insisted on piano lessons for their daughters at an early age when we lived in London. My sister must have been eight or nine when these began, and she took to it like a duck to water. I, three years younger, went along with her and had the basics taught me. <sighs> I loathed it. These lessons took place in a house quite near our own at Lewisham, and I only remember a rather stuffy room with a circular sofa covered in red plush where I sat while Lil practiced scales, arpeggios, and the advanced end of Ezra Reed's musical exercises. Needless to say, I hardly reached page three. When we moved, I had hoped fondly that this torture would cease. Lil was to continue her musical studies at school, and it was my hope that any ambition for me in that line would die a natural death. However, a music teacher gave lessons in the village, and I was signed on. A more reluctant pupil poor Miss Hill never had. She seemed to me a very old lady, small and afflicted with some spinal disability. She looked after her father, a handsome old gentleman who was probably then in his seventies, so that his daughter was probably then only in her forties. She dressed in dark clothes and wore a gold chain and spectacles. She was exceedingly kind and patient, but kept a ruler at hand for tapping errant fingers. I knew that ruler well. And we will 
learn more of Miss Reed's music lessons and that ruler next time.